Well, I'm talking to Linda Burnett, who was one of the founders of Disabled People Against the Cuts in 2010. So, Linda, tell us um, the circumstances that led to the setting up of DIPAC, and you can give a bit of background as well. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Um, well, at the time, myself and Eleanor Lesney, who's one of the other co-founders, mm -hmm. uh, were trustees for Warwickshire and Coventry CDP, mm -hmm. and we'd all just been on a weekend training course with Rachel Hurst um, on the UN Convention and Rights of Disabled People. And then George Osborne came along with his 2010 budget, um, threatening to slash all sorts of things for disabled people. So it seemed like um, a good opportunity to uh, try and oppose those cuts, um, especially having been on this training course, which was, you know, concentrating so much on our rights. Mm -hmm. um, so we arranged to join um, a march that was being uh, put on uh, to um, oppose the Tories at their conference in Birmingham. Um, I think at the time we just planned to do the march and we wanted to have a disabled people section mm -hmm. so that we could be visible. Um, we haven't actually planned to do more than that at that time. But that sort of um, involved Ellen and myself going to very tedious meetings with the police and council employees for weeks and weeks. And they were really concerned that vulnerable disabled people like us might get hurt joining in with a march. And I mean, they were terrified that someone's wheelchair might break down. So they tried to ban us from being part of the march. Um, but we inundated them with complaints from DDPOs, both in the UK and throughout Europe. And they backed down and um, agreed that we could, even though we were so vulnerable, take part <laughs> in the march. Um, I think after that, it became clear that at the time we didn't have any functioning national DPO to campaign against the cuts. And although we were told by lots of people that we were being very pessimistic and even the Tories couldn't treat disabled people as badly as that, um, sadly, we were right and they were wrong. Mm. And um, once we decided to set up DIPAC um, following a meeting in Birmingham with I think about six or seven other people involved in setting it up. Um, things just seem to take off. Yeah, if I'm in the middle of an interview, so if you can do it in about 20 minutes or so. 20, 25 minutes, okay? All right. Sorry about that. I forgot to turn off the phones before, before we got going. Carry yeah. on. I'll, I'll just I'll edit out the bits that um, interrupted there. Yeah. Well, there mean, was no, no campaigning group against the cuts nationally and other people were telling you it wasn't necessary. Things just seemed to take off and, I mean... At the time, there were so many cuts, it was really hard to know what to focus on. Mm -hmm. um, I think for me, one of the problems was we were always trying to stop cuts, which mm -hmm. obviously uh, is implied mm -hmm. in the name of the group, but um, mm -hmm. we couldn't sort of do any proactive campaigning uh, mm -hmm. to try and get things made better because there was too much to do to stop things getting worse. Um, and I think that's about it. That's more or less how DIPAC emerged and got started. So, well, what were the main elements of the DIPAC campaign? It's got been going on 12 years, really. But what do you, what do you see as the main things that you achieved over, over that time? Um, well, it's difficult to um, sort of pinpoint mm. any real achievements of you know, I mean, if you look at what's happening now, we could mm. say that we've we've really not achieved much. But um, I think one of the most important things is that 
Um, so many people say we've made such a difference to their life and that if we didn't exist, they would have killed themselves. Mm. And I think uh, just because we're there and fighting back, we actually give people a lot of hope mm. and help them fight back, mm. uh, both on an individual and a sort of um, a combined level. Mm. Um, I think, I mean, we were told by a retired TUC equality officer that we'd done more for disabled people in, um, I think it was about five years then, and the TUC had achieved in 100 years. Mm. And I think that reflects sort of one of the things which we've always tried to do, which is to um, educate non-disabled people and non-disabled groups that we work with um, to be inclusive and to meet access needs Mm. and... Uh, obviously sometimes it's quite difficult and you feel that you know you're banging your head against a brick wall but on the other hand uh, when groups like PA who I must sort of praise actually take on what you say um, it can be very um, powerful uh, to know that you know they they actually uh, do want to be inclusive and to um, meet people's needs. So you say, did, what was the initial use there? PA, TA? Sorry? Groups like, can you? Uh, People's Assembly. People's Assembly, right. Yeah, yeah they, they, they've been very good. Yeah, very yes, good. yes. I <clears> think <throat> the interesting thing, if, if you'd have done this in 90 in 2000 or 1990 because we had cuts as well then uh it wouldn't have taken off in my view because of the that you didn't have the internet you didn't have the ease of getting to people which it seemed to me being being a member in the early days it spread like wildfire really um so it was obviously your demands and your idea was the right idea it went with thousands of disabled people getting involved did it tell us a bit about how that early expansion took place? Um, Basically, a lot of it, I suppose, was through social media. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think um, particularly um, with the pandemic and the way that Zoom's taken off, Mm. having meetings is really easy um, because you don't have to travel around the country Mm -hmm. to actually meet up. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think all of that... I think all of that is good actually for disabled people because um, obviously beforehand if we want to have a meeting, uh, people would have to plan for possibly weeks in advance to make sure they had PAs available to come with them. Um, and now they don't have to do that. They can just join in from home. Um, but I think obviously having internet and um YouTube videos and all of that sort of thing, all those sort of uh, more modern technology mm. is does actually make campaigning much easier. Well, what do you think were the main negative impacts that you used and campaigned around of the austerity measures on the lives of disabled people? What what was the thing, the things that came up very strongly for you as a campaigning group? Um. Well, I think that obviously one of the main things we campaigned on was uh, the loss of the independent living fund. Mm. And I think that is still uh, a major problem. But I mean, if we're looking at the impacts on uh, the well-being and lives of disabled people Mm. um, due to the austerity measures of the last 12 years, um, I have to say the list seems endless. Mm. But um, when we first sent off the first report to the UN, we had 42 separate cuts that disabled people were facing listed. Mm. Um, I think uh, the impacts on well-being are, I mean, obviously during COVID, the government's total failure to protect and support mm. disabled people was very evident. Mm. Um, in England, we had no BSL. There was no easy read versions of information made available to people. Many disabled people had um, DNRs illegally imposed on them. And I think older disabled care home residents were effectively killed by the government by having covered positive patients sent to their homes. 
Mm. Um, the government uh, estimated that they saved five billion pounds on pensions they didn't have to pay out um, because mm. of the deaths of older care home residents. I think the other problem is that disabled people in receipt of ESA um, suffered uh, even more financial hardship than other people because they didn't get the £20 uplift mm. in universal credit during the pandemic. Mm. Um, the PIP system, which you know replaced disability living allowance, um, is another total mess. Um, over 70% of people win their tribunals, but quite often have to wait 12 months to get to the tribunal. And now there are waiting lists of over 12 months um, to have renewals processed. Mm. And although the government actually claim they want to get disabled people into sustainable employment, the access to work system has totally collapsed as well. Mm. There are huge backlogs and mm total failure to pay staff promptly, mm. um, which is causing complete chaos and leaving disabled people without the support they need to work. Mm. And then if you look at basic things like a health service, mm. um, that's gradually got worse and worse over the past 12 years. And obviously that's been exacerbated by the COVID pandemic. Yeah. But we have lots of mental health services, both for adults and children, uh, very few local emergency beds available and often months or even years wait mm. waits for treatment mm. particularly I think in London getting an appointment with a GP can take weeks a &E waiting times are horrendously long and mm. even uh, the ambulance service is in crisis uh, with ambulances stuck up outside hospitals unable to mm. um, take their patients into the hospital. Mm. I think poverty and malnutrition has also increased for the past 12 years, and many disabled people have been forced to choose between eating and heating for that length of time. So the cost of living crisis, which we now face in some cases, is going to lead not just to people choosing between eating and heating, but between living and dying for those disabled people who may not be able to afford the energy they need for their life-saving equipment, such as kidney dialysis machines, BiPAP, CPAP machines, and even fridges. I mean, we obviously know about the tragic case of David Clapson, who uh, needed to keep his insulin in the fridge, but had no money to pay for his electricity, and so died. Mm. Um, Sadly, there's also a continuing lack of accessible and affordable homes and the restrictions and the time taken to ass assess disabled facilities grants is another negative factor um, impacting negatively on disabled people's well-being. Mm. Um, I think the other major problem that disabled people have, which again causes extreme poverty, is charging for social care. Mm. Um, I mean, people have most or all of their PIP taken away from them to pay towards social care. Mm. Um, and the people with the highest support needs uh, have the most taken away because they are charged more because they might need overnight care. Mm. Um, uh, the minimum income guarantee hadn't gone up since 2015, and this year it rose with inflation, but only 3%, whereas now we're facing inflation of 11%. Um, a lot of people have ongoing and lengthy battles to get their disability-related expenses accepted, and all of this really is pushing people further and further into destitution. All people are trying to survive without the care they need to support them to live independently. Mm. Obviously, generally, uh, social care is in crisis, um, partly because of the horrendous cuts to local authority budgets for the last 12 years, mm. but also because of Brexit and the loss of freedom of movement for um, live-in care staff. Mm. But I think it's really important that disabled people aren't forced to live in fear 
of their next annual review or assessment for the support they need to live independently. Mm. And do you think there's been a, a, a trend of against uh, independent living, so people are being forced uh, away from having control over their situation? By yeah, way. I mean, we've come, come across lots of cases where people are being told they can't have overnight care, and if they need overnight care, they have to go into a care home. Mm. Or do without, mm. uh, which obviously for some people just isn't safe. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So generally, a not a good picture. Um, no, I think generally it's pretty miserable. And I mean, um, I don't know if you've seen it, but Greater Manchester Coalition of Disabled People have just brought out. Um, the results of a survey they did on 2,000 people living in that area, and it's the results are pretty horrendous about the poverty levels, um, the lack of services that people can get, and uh, it's just generally quite depressing. And the, the sharp end of this really is that large numbers of people have lost their lives. I mean, I think there's an academic study that suggests that during the austerity measures, something over 300,000 people extra died. Is, do you think that's related to these, these cuts? Yeah, I think it's related to all of the cuts. I mean, uh, poverty, malnutrition, mm -hmm. uh, lack of support, uh, to live safely at home or, you know, go out and take part in the community, uh, cuts to health services. Um, I mean, we know that people with learning difficulties that quite often don't get the health care that they should get. Um, um, we're also finding that um, quite often uh, people with cataracts who are wheelchair users because there aren't facilities to remove their cataracts Mm. Um, in a lot of those centres that do the treatments uh, mm. just aren't having their treatment done until the very last... You mean they're not accessible? Minute. The places are not accessible? Yeah, yeah. I must say I found that when I recently visited Moorfields Hospital that I had to go in through a private clinic in order to get to the general area. So mm. it's those sorts of things, I suppose. And... There was also something that you've campaigned on quite a lot, which is the number of people on benefits or waiting for benefits and drawing attention to statements made by coroners that people have died as a result of that. I mean, obviously, the thing I haven't mentioned is sanctions because yeah. that affects disabled people as well. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I think particularly disabled people who aren't in the support group of ESA. Um, Mm. Uh, or who have to claim uh, job seekers allowance and mm. they're particularly prone to being sanctioned and left without any money for mm. food, fuel or anything else mm. because they can't meet the uh, conditionality. Mm. So all of this in the first few years of DIPAT you were campaigning against, but what led you then to take a, uh, under the, the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability uh, Protocol, um, to take a case to Geneva? What led to that? Um, well, I think no one had ever used the optional protocol against their government before. Mm. And um, the minimum we wanted was the UK to be the first ever country to be investigated using the protocol. Mm. Um, which fortunately we were signed up to, although not all countries are. Mm. Um, we also felt that although the UN can't force governments to do anything, that this would leave an undeniable historic documentation of all the regression of rights of disabled people in the UK. Mm. It was a really difficult process and it lasted over three years. And um, one of the things that was particularly difficult, and I think because it was the first time it had ever been used, uh, mm. everything had to be kept really secret. And mm. the UN kept saying, if you tell anyone, we'll stop the investigation and we won't you know, come to the UK and uh, carry out our inquiry. Mm. But I think the, the one major advantage of the inquiry was that it was 
no longer just Dipak saying, our human rights were being gravely and systematically mm -hmm. abused. It was actually the UN Disability Committee, mm -hmm. um, which obviously has been an advantage in campaigning. Mm. And, but the, the government's response to that was try and, trying to pretend it wasn't really happening, I think. Mm. How, how did that work out? I mean... Um, well, they took longer than they should have done to send all their reports back. So, like, uh, we'd write some, they got six months to reply, but it would take them about ten months. Mm. Um, and, I mean, basically... Uh, Although the committee found that there was grave and systematic violation of disabled people's human rights and regression of those rights mm. and made a list of recommendations to the government, um, they haven't actually implemented any of the recommendations. Mm. Um, the one thing, though, that I think is positive is that unlike other countries which are examined by the UN Disability Committee every five years, the UK has continues to have to make annual reports of how disabled people's human rights have been progressed and um, civil society organisations got a right to respond to that. Mm. 